Welcome to Attachment Aid for Two. Today we have a special guest on the podcast, and it is Lieutenant Rosales. Um, he is a, a former alumni of UTSA, and he's going to be giving us a lot of insight about who he is, um, you know, um, his time in ROTC, his time in IFT UPT, and we get into leadership questions. And so, yeah. Welcome to the pod t- podcast, Lieutenant Rosales. Glad to be here. <laughs> All righty. So we'll get started with, um, you know, where are you from? Um, tell us about like your upbringing, upbringing when, you know, as a kid and throughout high school. Yeah, for sure. So um, I grew up in El Paso originally. I'm from El Paso, Texas. I've grown up in Texas my whole life. Grew up there till about seventh grade year. Moved to San Antonio eighth grade year. Uh, and then went to uh, Health Careers High School. So, uh, oh, okay. High school, yeah, I went to, okay. I went to <laughs> magnet school. Yeah, yeah. I thought I was going to be a physical therapist, and then it changed to dentist. And so I was like, all right, cool. I got that going for me. And then I joined uh, college. I went to UTSA. Um, and my original goal to come to UTSA was to walk on as a, a baseball player. Um, mm-hmm. So that was my main. Oh, I, remember that. I never had I never had UTSA like as ROTC or like any military like in my future at that point. So I tried to walk on. Sadly, I didn't get it. But I became a manager for the baseball team, and it wasn't until I think sophomore year, like second semester, first semester sophomore year, is uh, when I decided to change my life around and join ROTC. Uh, during that time, it was just really rough for me. You know, emotionally, mentally, you know, everything just wasn't going my way. Grades were going down the drain. I think I had like a 1.9 GPA at that point. It was, it was bad. It was bad. So, uh, yeah, it was really bad. And then, so I thought I was going to enlist in the Marines. I'm sorry to say it. At, th- at first, I was going to enlist in the Marines because uh, my best friend was a Marine. And he was like, yeah, join me. We can be buddies together go through Marsoc and special ops and I was like oh hell yeah like oh sorry oh yeah that sounds <laughs> and uh so I went to go talk to someone one of my best friend's dads and he's like no you're, you're too smart for that you I don't see you in that future career path and he said to come to dead eight four two talk to Mr. Yano the great Mr. Yano he'll be there forever and ever um and talk to him, do it for a semester, and then see how that is. And then, I, and he's like, after that semester, if you don't want to do it anymore, if you want to go enlist and do whatever, uh, then you can go do that. I was like, all right, cool, whatever. It's one more semester. It's not gonna hurt. Then I joined ROTC, and and the rest is history. Now I'm at this point in my life. Um, so now, ROTC wise, in college. Um, started sophomore year is a little late, so I had to do an extra year so I did five years instead of four uh should originally go see so uh throughout your time in rotc you've been a cta a wing commander uh what has rotc prepared you for the most for active duty after actually experiencing a bit of active duty um so it's a little different it's a little different if you go the aviation route um, because in ROTC, we teach about leadership, we t- teach you about working as a team, we teach you about delegation, you know, how to treat your people, um, just how to be a really good leader in the Air Force once you get out. But in the aviation world, you don't start leading people until you're like, if you fake, you'll start leading people. Um, so I was maybe like a first lieutenant, but you know, you just have to be really, really good at pilot training to do that. But for most people, it's not to like captain when you start leading people. Um, as far as like all the other careers, um, what I've, I mean, let me see. I've talked to Lieutenant Dominguez. He's a force support officer. Um, he absolutely loves his job. I, I, I think talking to him, I think RTC really prepared any, anybody and everybody at the detachment to go into those type of career fields like force support logistics anything other than aviation because that's when you take care of people like day one you're put into a situation where you have a whole flight like right now i think he's a a flight commander in charge of like 
all of these people underneath him. And usually they're not a flight commander to like a captain. So he took a captain spot and he just stepped up and he's doing really well right now. Um, so I think it really prepared us for that, that part of active duty air force. Um, but aviation wise, all you have to do is take care not of so much. Yeah. All you have to do is take care of yourself. Make sure you, you study, 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 making sure you're taking care of yourself. And that's pretty much it. But as far as regular jobs, like not aviation, um, that really prepared us for sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. So kind of just like impacted more of those people who are going straightly into, you know, the security forces positions where they have like 40 people under them. Those oh, are the yeah, people that sure. probably get the most, but then the, the aviators probably don't get that till like later since oh, they're no, yeah, a student no. all over again. Yeah. I mean, I follow a lot of people still like on Instagram and stuff like that. And so Lieutenant Carmichael, now you brought up security forces. Yeah. He's actually on CGO of like the quarter, like multiple times already. Like his okay. internet game, like he, he's a, uh, what are they called? Like, uh, where they re-enlist the, the ceremonies, you know, like. Mm. The, oh, okay. Yeah. Contract. So he's done like three of those already because they wanted him to do it because they loved him as a leader. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and then I think. That's pretty cool. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Ramjit, I think just got CGO of the quarter too. So. I mean, it's it's great. We're doing great <laughs> attachment, you know. So we're we're building great leaders here. Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> That's a great detachment over here at the A42. Yeah. Um, yep. So um, now let's talk a little bit more about IFT UPT. Um, what is the day to day of IFT and UPT kind of look like? You know, like from when you wake up. So when you go to bed, all of it. Yeah, um, I'll talk about IFT first. Um, okay. Anybody that goes to IFT or sees this can probably attest to this because I've told them this because they've asked me. But so usually day to day at IFT, you wake up, you crack of dawn. It's probably like 4.30, you wake up, you go to formal briefs. Those take like an hour. And then like maybe 15 minutes, you might have like the first flight out. So you have 15 minutes to prepare and get ready and get your uh, mission data card ready for your instructor, have it all filled out, ready to go, know your routes, know your stuff. So that's like waking up that day, but it, your next day really starts the day before. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you're done flying, you will, um, so it starts the day before, um, your mission plan literally all afternoon like till you fall asleep pretty much. Um, you'll be in your flight room, going through the routes, like uh, chair flying your whatever, the route, chair flying everything, um, going over comms, going over your maneuvers, like ins and outs, everything, just to prepare you for the next day. So it really starts the day before. And then you go to sleep. Um, it's really hard to actually dream while you're at IFT because that's all you think about is flying. So... <laughs> So you'll still think about it when you go to sleep um, and then you wake up and like I said, crack a dawn, go to formal briefs. Those at IFT take 45 minutes to an hour. Um, they go over uh, emergency procedures. They go over the weather for the day, the airfields that we're going to, everything that you need for that day. And then you guys leave and then you guys go and you guys, then you guys wait for your, your time, your, your step time. And then you guys will, go brief, do pre-flight brief with your instructor. They'll be like, okay, cool, this is what we're doing. And then you guys will step. When you guys go step, then you'll walk up to the plane, pre-flight check, everything like that. It's a whole bunch of checklists that you have to know. And then you take off. And then you take off and you go to the MOA, which is like a, an air, air, a space that they have reserved for us and stuff like that. You go out to the MOA, do your stuff, come back, and then you do a, a debrief. It takes like 30, 45 minutes, maybe. Um, might go a little longer depending on the IP. And that's, is that with the instructor pilot? Yeah, yeah. So that's with your, your instructor pilot. Yeah, over there at, uh, at IFT, they have a lot of people that either have been in the military fine or like general aviation. So okay. I have like, they've been fine private for, you know, a while, stuff like that. It, it's actually pretty tough to to get into IFT as an instructor. So 
they, they get the best of the best for sure. Just know that. So you're in good hands. I heard, yeah. I heard it was like a contracted out kind of like facility called like DOS aviation or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, they think they actually, I remember when I was there, they were going through like a bunch of name changes. Um, cause it was DOS aviation and then, uh, they changed it to something else. And then when I left, they changed it to something else. So I, I don't know exactly the name of it now, but I know it's in Pueblo, Colorado. It's really windy. So, <laughs> it depends on when you go. Cause if you go when it snows, like you'll be there for longer than you expected because you'll get a lot of delays. Mm. So for flying just for snow, you know, the little DA 20 can't, you know, do a lot. So it's a, it's a lawn mower with wings. So, right. So, that. so basically the day-to-day is kind of like you, you wake up early and then kind of like by noon, you're done with what you did that day. And then the rest of the day you're prepping for the next day. No, not necessarily because you can have a late flight. So oh, okay. you can have, you can have a, you can, they can pretty much fly you all day. It just, wherever they schedule you. So you'll know when your flight is for the next day, you might have like a three o'clock flight. And then you, so, so you'll, after your formal brief, you'll have all that day to either study, work out, do whatever, but usually everybody just studies or just goes into the room. Um, and then you fly and then you finish. And then let's say you have a late flight, then you have to study for your next flight. So it might be like maybe six o'clock by the time you actually start studying. And then you'll study from there to like nine thirties when I tried to knock it off at nine thirty. Um, but usually everybody keeps going till they pass out falling asleep or whatever and then you wake up and then you do it all over again and it's just a constant cycle yeah and it's how long is it two not two weeks like three to six weeks uh so for pilots it's different than like rpas because rpas have okay. to do like a longer the, like rpas will have night flights and they'll do cross countries um so they do, they're there a little longer than pilots, but I'm, I'm not too sure the exact like weeks, um, maybe like four weeks, say five weeks, maybe give or take. Okay. So, yeah. um, so what is your advice throughout UPT and IFT for all the about to commission pilots out there that are kind of like waiting to go to UPT, like, like, what's your advice for when they get there? Like, the mindset to go in, and just kind of like the day to day. Yeah, for sure. So, right when you get there, give yourself some time to adjust. Hold on, one second, one second, one second. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to ask that question again. Someone just knocked on the door. Okay. Okay. Oh, never mind. Hey, what's up? Okay. Here, I'm going to ask, I'm going to redo that one. All right. So, um, so what is your, like, it, um, so what is your advice? Okay, let me say, what is your advice for all the, uh, about to be commissioning, um, uh, pilot selects that are about to go to, um, IFT, then UPT, like just advice for like the day-to-day for when they get there, you know, what mindset, so they could um do the best they can during training yeah um so when you get here or not here at del rio but any base you get to for pilot training um wherever it is um, take time to adjust to where you're stationed you know get to know the area where everything's at you know take a month maybe a two because when you when you get to upt you usually wait more so like, for example, I'll use myself. So I waited after I commissioned. I waited a whole year just so I could get to my base. And then from there, I waited almost six months, seven months, just so I can start IFT or UPT. So, so you're going to be waiting for a while, depending on how backed up they are. So in that time, if you have enough time, just get adjusted to where you're at. Get used to the area, go out, do stuff. Um, and then slowly start incorporating like checklists and, you know, verbiage and stuff like that. That would be my biggest advice. 
is to slowly start incorporating it. So when it happens and you guys get to that point in your training, it's not foreign. It's not like you're looking at the checklist for the first time and you're like, what does this yellow stuff mean? What do this numbers mean? Like, what's a call out? Like, how's a call out supposed to sound like? So yeah, like the checklist here at UPT, just know what the highlighted stuff means, what that, how it's supposed to sound, stuff like that. Um, when you get to IFT, they have the same thing. They have checklists just like that. Um, stuff that are highlighted, how it's supposed to be performed, verbiage, stuff like that. Um, just really start slowly incorporating stuff in your day-to-day, -day, not like full-on study the checklist, maybe like 30 minutes, maybe not even that, like 20 minutes a day, just going through the checklist, going through the checklist, knowing the verbiage, stuff like that. And that stuff you can get from previous people. So previous, okay. previous, um, previous uh, student pilots, wherever you go, they always have what they call gouge. I don't know if you've heard that word. Um, people will say, if you live by the gouge, you die by the gouge. So just be careful what information you get and always double check it and, you know, cross-reference stuff. But usually they'll give you some really good gouge out there as to like verbiage, like maneuvers, anything pilot related, it'll always be passed down from class to class and they'll just like give it to the next class. So just always just ask someone if you know someone out there, just like here in Del Rio, you'll probably know, uh, let me see who's here. Me and Lieutenant Victorina. Um, he'll probably still be here. I don't know when you get here, but we'll probably still be here. Um, so we'll pass on that gouge to you and then you just go through it slowly but surely start reading your pubs, which are your publications that you have to know. Um, there's a whole lot. I mean, don't stress yourself out. I know exactly word for word, but just be familiar with it. So if you do get a question about anything in there, you know, you might not know it off the top of your head. Like if the instructor asks you, oh, what is blah, 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 blah. You can be like, oh, sir, I don't know it. But if I didn't want to know it, I would go to this publication to look for it. At least you know where it's at. So you're not just like, oh, I don't know, like, where is it? So just start familiarizing your stuff with stuff like that. It's the biggest advice for training. Okay. Um, um, yeah. So uh, there's obviously a lot of studying that needs to be done throughout IFT and UPT. Um, yeah. So like day to day, like what time do you have to like connect with your peers? And like, what does your free time during IFT and UPT kind of look like? So IFT is going to be a little different than UPT um, because at IFT, you guys, are, you guys will be like in a hotel pretty much that's connected to where you guys fly. So your flight room is literally next to you or like down the hall. So most of the time you guys will be in the flight room studying unless it's like the weekend. So on the weekend, usually at IFT, you go out, you go to like Denver or um, Colorado Springs, which is, you know, up north. That's what most people did. I went to go golf at the academy a couple of times with a couple of friends. Um, so on the weekends is really when you start clicking with your flight, um, getting to hang out. But during the day, the only time you actually like hang out with people is in your flight room or you go out to get something to eat at the end of the night or something like that. There won't be a lot of um, like hanging out like casually, like, Hey, let's play video games or something like that. Cause I mean, I don't think I knew anybody that took the PS4 or PS5 or whatever. To, yeah I, I wouldn't recommend that i don't recommend it. You'll be on that team more than you'll study but yeah during like monday through friday it's in the flight room um uh in the flight room is when you'll be spending time with most of your flight mates monday through friday that's your casual time i guess when you okay can, um, friday saturday sunday that's when you guys make plans go out go to, like I said, Denver, Colorado, spring, stuff like that, make plans. But UPT, it's different because your flight room is like blocks away, not just down the street. So um, there's different phases in UPT as well. So you've been phase one, phase two, phase three. In phase one, you won't be in the flight rooms. So you'll just be in the Sims or in your room studying. So that time, like not being with your flight mates will be like going out to eat or asking them for help studying just like IFT Monday through Friday. And then you guys will make plans, go out Friday night. Usually people will party and do stuff here. Um, or people might go to San Antonio, just two and a half hours away, but that's like rare because they want to come back and study. 
So that's when you'll spend time with most of your classmates Monday through Friday. And that's how it is for phase one or phase two and phase three. And then again, like I said, on the weekend, you guys can hang out, party, go out for drinks at Club XL or, I don't know, going to Del Rio if there's anything to do here. But yeah, so <laughs> that's pretty much how it works. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that there's like a lot of time to be with your peers and yeah, the, you know, the first year for sure. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, so next off to next question. So while at IFT and UPT, you know, what does your support group usually look like? Um, obviously, you're with your peers all the time, um, but like usually when you have any questions, like do you mainly go to your peers, or like can you ask like the instructor any questions? Or all the trainees kind of like left to dry and everyone kind of just like learns together like um, in a group? No, no, no. So, <clears throat> so there's, you can ask the instructors there because they'll be there all day when you guys are there as well. So there's always be a free one if you have any questions. They'll, they want to help. That's what they're there for. They'd rather you come to them than suffer on your flight later down the line. So they love answering questions. Um, again, your flight mates, you guys can go to your flight mates all the time. Um, there's even, cause the flight rooms are so close together at IFT. Um, you guys can, you can go to other flights and like talk to them and ask questions. Maybe they have a different way of studying or a different way of looking at things. You know, that also helps. Um, let me see. As far as like, uh, your support group and stuff like that, your flight mates, of course, if you need any help, the IPs are there. They're always there for you guys. Whenever they're there, they want to help. And then afterwards, you guys really have to like lean on each other because the IPs will leave for the day. Like they don't live there at mm. DOS or whatever it's called now, but they don't live there. They live, they leave and probably live like 45 minutes an hour away and they make the, the drive every, every day. Oh, dang. They leave and you guys are there literally by yourself. Like you guys are in the hotel room, like by yourself. You guys can be in the flight room. You guys can do whatever you guys want. So that's when you guys really have to lean on each other after that point. Um, usually, okay. yeah. Oh, that's what I'm saying. So you'll be in a flight with two classes in it. So it'll be like a senior class and a baby class. And so that senior class, they'll be there and ask them as much questions as you guys want. They want to help. Well, the one that I was in, they were like, hey, if you guys have any questions, let us know. Like, we literally just did this or we've been through it. And I know this is tough or stuff like that. So you can easily reach out to them and they can give you, again, gouge and, uh, and that's how you guys are going to succeed. It's really, really leaning on your flight mates and your senior class for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, for that year that um, all the, uh, not even just uh, pilot trainees, but like CISO um, and all the other aviation jobs. So like, we're probably going to be here for a long time, like waiting to leave. Mm -hmm. um depending on the afsc like is there um anything that you kind of like recommend us to do during that time that we're like in our city kind of waiting like is, is your recommendation more to just like you know relax for the year that's about to come or to like get started early no live it up go out like <laughs> explore like there's a there's a for example this is this is actually pretty funny one of my buddies here, uh, he also had to wait because he was in ROTC. He waited for a year. And what he did in that year, he bought a van and he traveled across the United States he, with that van, just end to end. That's all he did. <laughs> he lived out of his van. He would stop and shower and like, you know, wherever he can. He had friends along the way, like live it up, like do anything and everything you've ever wanted to do, like really have fun because it's tough no matter what aviation career you go into abm CISO, pilot rpa like it's it's tough it's going to be really really tough time for you so really live it up have fun don't think about pilot training don't think about any type of training just have fun with your family your friends your dog your cats whatever just <laughs> oh yeah for sure have fun don't recommend enjoy kind of like the last quality time you have no, yeah, for sure. And especially if you're used to like living with your family, like I was, because um, yeah. I was living in San Antonio with my family and they were there all of college, all of high school. So like, I was so used to it. I didn't never lived on my own because my parents were there. I could just live with them. 
And then now I kind of, I, like, I guess not, I would say take it for granted. I, I took it for granted because they were so used to being there with them. But then when you leave, like, you just want them to be here for you, to help you out in these hard times, to just be someone to just come home to and be like, man, today was tough. Um, so really spend time with your family, especially if you're going to go out to pilot training, um, your girlfriends, whatever. So really cherish that time for sure as well. Yeah. Okay, but I appreciate that. I was hoping that was the answer. No, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that for sure, 100% is the answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, so is there, uh, now we're going to switch it over kind of to like, uh, to more of like ROTC stuff. Um, so uh, anything, is there, anything out there that you think that like the POC like okay so for example like let's pretend there's like a whole bunch of knobs right like you have like um the volunteer knob you know the uh, the leadership knob like the uh mm, probably a bad analogy but like like you know in RCC there's like a lot of things that you need to do right um <clears throat> out of all the things in RTC that like you need to do. Um, is there anything that you kind of wish that you would have focused on, like dialed that knob a little more while you were in ROTC to kind of like help prepare yourself for active duty? Um don't oh shoot. I don't know if you heard that. Um me personally, uh, I don't want to, I mean, it's going to sound bad, but I don't think in my, my perspective, I think I did everything in ROTC that really helped me here mm -hmm. in my situation. What I would recommend for anybody that's in ROTC, especially 100s, I know 100s are like, you know, nervous and scared to go to the detachment and like, just walk around even in the halls and stuff like that. But I really encourage anybody that starts off in RTC to live and breathe in that detachment to like really get to know your people. Um, that's going to be huge, 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 huge. Now that I'm, you know, doing what I do now, like knowing your people really helps you and really, you know, gets the ball rolling and gets jobs done and stuff like that. So start, start now, get out of your comfort zone. Just go talk to a higher ranking cadet, you know, ask them for help or ask them how's their day going just to break that ice or something. Um, I recommend getting into any clubs, as many clubs as possible, really getting out there. I mean, not like a bunch to where you're just completely stretched out thin, but, you know, if you wanted to, you know, really be in what, what kind of clubs do you guys have now? Um, we have the Arnold Air Society. We have the honor guard. Yeah. We have, yeah. Okay. So like honor guard, if you really, really want to do honor guard, but you're too scared because you've never, you know, done those movements or something and they just look really good doing it. Like, just do it. Everybody starts somewhere, you know, don't be afraid to fail. Be in that club, talk to that person, you know, apply for that leadership role. When I was in uh, ROTC, right. I never it pictured myself being a wing commander. Like I didn't, I was like, no, like whatever. Like I'll never be a wing commander. I don't have that capability. But then, you know, I started talking to people and they kept asking me like, hey, like, are you gonna, you're gonna apply for a wing commander, right? And I was like, uh, no. And they're like, hey, you should, you should do it. Why not? Like, I think you'd be good. And I was like, and I was like, all right, I, I guess so. I'm just gonna put my name in the hat. And if I get picked, I get picked, you know? Like, don't be afraid of not, getting what the result you want um so i put my name in there and i became the wing commander for a semester which was great i absolutely loved it great great time um oh man. okay um absolutely loved being a wing commander right it was great great opportunity um, really helped me grow and be out of my comfort zone being able to delegate being able to work with others even though like i wanted to do everything myself you know i had to learn because that's the only way to get stuff done is lean on your people, really trust them, and then go from there. Um, that's how I got a pilot slot. 
you know, that, that's how I got that slot. Um, Major Odom, I still remember him. Major Odom, I took my AFOQT. It said I had great pilot. He's like, hey, your pilot scores, you know, pretty high. Like, you want to try to pass for pilot? And I was like, nah, sir, like, I don't think my grades are going to do it. And then he's like, just do it. The worst they're going to say is no, right? You, you weren't expecting it anyways, so just do it. I was like, okay, cool. Put my name in the hat, got the slot, took the tests, and now I'm here in Del Rio, you know? So just don't, don't be afraid to really put yourself out there. If you fail, it's okay. You know, it doesn't matter. Fail now in ROTC so you can learn while you're in active duty. Because when you're in active duty, if you fail, that affects a whole lot of people. It might affect, you know, their lives. It might affect someone's paycheck if you were in, you know, work as an FSS person, you know. It might, if you work with money, logistics, contracting, if you miss a number, you know, if you mess up and be like, hey, it's supposed to be a thousand and really it's supposed to be 10,000. Like that's a huge difference. And that's an Air Force problem, you know. So fail now in RCC, get out of your comfort zone and just, yeah, just really put yourself out there for sure. As like, so kind of just put dial up that, put yourself out there. Now, oh, yeah. Dial up the networking knob with all yep. your peers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So the networking perfect. knob and the uh, put yourself out there now. If there's the okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Next question. What are the differences between the active duty and the ROTC kind of uh, like environment wise? Mm. Like the day to day. Again, it's it's going to be different um, because I. I took that aviation route. Um, so it's a complete, it's really not the same, that environment. Cause again, you're working by yourself or you're working with other people that are going through the same thing with you. Um, but one thing that I can say right now is the job that I'm doing now, right? The environment, In ROTC is people were there to help you. That's why I said fail because they're the cadre and everything are there to help you out. Your, you know, your upperclassmen are there to help you out to learn. But then when you get active duty, like now <clears throat> and the job I'm doing, like if I fail and if I do something wrong, then it's on me. Like, no, like I'm going to have to try to figure it out. I'm going to have to, you know, ask the questions. I'm going to have to reach out to people and do all of that stuff. Um, if, one of the people below me, you know, might mess up or something. I have to, you know, bite the bullet, you know, take it, be responsible for it, and then go from there. Um, so in ROTC, it was more like nurturing environments, trying to help you guys succeed, make you guys good leaders, give you guys all the advice you guys need. And then active duty, that's when you really put it to the test. That's when you really put what you've learned in ROTC, what you've got from your cadre, you know, into the real world. So, uh, so teaching environment, ROTC, application environment, active duty. So, okay. Yeah. Um, are there any like similarities between AFROTC and active duty? Um, let me think about that one. Similarities in ROTC and active duty. teamwork these are just you know stuff that really translate over is working as a team i know especially you can attest to this when you guys were in ftp flight for the first time you guys had to really work together like the whole storming norming performing stuff you know like correlates over learn how to work with a team learn how to be a team player um that correlates over um in your, I think the most stuff that you learn active duty wise is in your 400 year. That's, that's when you'll get the most knowledge and information to take on into your, whatever career field you're going to be in. Um, but as far as all the other 100s to 300s, you know, it's about building a leader, stuff like that from the ground up. Um, 
yeah, whatever you learn in 400 year, take that and then move it on to active duty because that's when you learn the most for sure. Okay. Um, that's kind of like my impression of like, that, that's basically my exact impression of ROTC too. Like um, all the things that we're learning this semester, kind of like how the whole world kind of operates and mm -hmm. um, it feels much more like real. Oh yeah. Um, like totally like, totally like like this is what we're gonna kind of expect um so like this year has been like super like mentally stimulating mm -hmm. um in terms of like you know all the knowledge we've been lear learning because it's totally different from like the 100 to 300 years yep yep now yeah in 400 year i remember it's a lot more real world into active duty like um, i don't know if you guys are still doing this but when you guys fill out like um an loe or oprs or stuff like that um like that correlates for sure because you're going to do that in the air force as a leader you have to make those you have to create those you have to make one for yourself to send up to someone or you know vice versa so that really goes over so whatever you learn yeah, for you here really grab onto that we, we literally have an opr due tonight so <laughs> yeah, yeah so, we're doing so that. Really, <laughs> so again mess up do it i mean I know you guys get grades on this, but it's okay if you don't get a hundred because it's not going to be perfect your first time, you know. Um, you're not, right. you know, lieutenant colonel that's done this for years. So, yeah. right. Um, so next question: um, Is there anything about active duty that like surprised you once you went into it? <laughs> uh, I laugh about this one because, like I said earlier, um, I used to live with my parents, so like. I really didn't get that sense of being an adult, I guess you can say, like living on my own, having to pay for my food, you know, my bills, my groceries, bills at all, pretty much, right? So that really, like, hit me hard in the face when I got here, um, especially, you know, as a college kid. So, uh, yeah, coming active duty, being by yourself, having to buy your own food, having to actually feed yourself, like having to worry about your car payments, uh, you know just being a, an actual adult you know they have to like i think the other day when i was talking to one of my co-workers we were talking about roth iras like <laughs> like uh, <laughs> i like it's just i guess being an adult at that point um i'm pretty sure you know people in college right now live on their own or might be a little older than most but um newer you know newer lieutenants into the military game that haven't been there or prior enlisted and stuff like that. That's, I think that because you have to do everything on your own, like no one's going to hold your hand as an LT and like, like, Hey, you have to schedule your dental appointment. Like, let's go. Like, no, like you have to really be on top of it. You have to be here, be an adult. Plus you have to study for whatever you're doing at tech school. You have to study for all that stuff. You have to make sure priorities in place, you know, any school you go to, um, and then pilot training here, like I said before. Sorry. So this one's gonna be more for the 200s. Yeah. Um, for the 200s that are about to go to field training this summer, what type of mindset should they have going into field training? To crush it, to represent the debt as best as you possibly can. Like we're, we're such a great detachment and you have to go into, field training and not be afraid because there's going to be a lot of people that are afraid to step up, be that day one leader, you know, like show that you're there to, you know, be that day one leader. Some people might look at it as like, Oh, they're just, you know, cocky or whatever. Like they just want to, you know, kiss a butt and try to look good, but like, don't do it in that aspect. Like don't do it just because you want to look good in front of your flight commander or, you know, be that, person that's cocky you know go in there with your head high dead out for two you know they've taught you everything you possibly need to know for field training and just be you know just be ready to put everything you've learned into work you know you've been through all of that we've put you in those situations or you guys put them in those situations so don't be afraid that's number one number one number one don't be afraid don't be afraid to stand up for your flight don't be afraid to stand up and be that day one leader. If you mess up, don't be afraid to, you know, to fess up. Don't be afraid to be like, hey, I, I made a mistake. 
I'm, I'm sorry, stuff like that. Because you guys will do GLPs, you know, out in the woods and you might, you know, not use your compass right and you guys go in the opposite direction and they can be like, hey, what the heck? Like, what happened? You can't be like, oh, my, my equipment, my, you know, stuff like that. Like, no, I'll be like, oh, dude, you know what? I messed up. I'm sorry. Like, let's go back. Because they'll look at you and be like, oh, okay, you know, he's not making an excuse. You know, we fixed it when we could and then we moved on. And then they won't make any other excuses of like, oh no, he's making excuses. Like he, like, then they'll just keep going and then it'll get to the flight. And then the flight just comes right on you and just not good. So yeah, just don't be afraid, stand out, keep your head high and don't be afraid for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lieutenant Rosales. I appreciate you so much for coming on, taking the time out of your day to come on the podcast and give us all, you know, your knowledge. Um, so I really, really appreciate it.